So now we'll talk kind of from a broad sense about um, modes and means of production. So economies are defined as a system of production, distribution, and consumption of resources. Economics is the study of economies. Now, most economists focused on modern nations and capitalist systems. What anthropology has to offer is kind of a broader understanding of economic principles by gathering data on non-industrial economies. We do this through the field of economic anthropology. This is a, a studies economics in a comparative perspective. There's been some really interesting research that's come out of economic anthropology. For one, uh, there was a, a paper that was published by Heinrich and McElreath and about 30 other authors that looked at uh, kind of the evolution of cooperation in um, 80 different small-scale societies and um, typically what economists have done or one of the things economists have done is uh, kind of studied economic decision-making behavior and they quite frequently use uh, large university undergraduate classes for this and so they've done something or played a series of economic games called the ultimatum game and the dictator game and, and in those games right, we will explain the kind of the premise of the game first um, I as the researcher have 10 monetary units I'm going to offer those 10 units to you as the player you are playing with a partner um, that po you're going to make an offer to your partner of how much of those 10 units you're willing to share um, the uh, the partner then gets to either accept or reject your offer if they accept it you both get to keep the money if they reject it nobody gets the money and so when played with undergraduates in introductory classes um, there's only really one offer that's made, and that is a completely fair offer of uh, splitting it 50-50. And so economists have wondered if perhaps this represented some innate aspect of humanity, that we were inherently fair, that we were inherently um, equitable. <clears throat> we could probably just look at modern society and say that eh, maybe not, but um, so to answer this question, they wanted to play with uh, smaller scale societies where food sharing is the norm, where resource sharing is the norm, and uh, they did so, and what they found was that there was no rhyme nor reason to how um, other cultures played this game. Uh, in groups like the Aceh that share their food absolutely evenly, um, they regularly made offers anywhere from two to eight. Um, in groups like the Lama Larens that have cooperative large like huge game hunting because they're going after whales um, they made really really small offers so there wasn't <clears throat> there doesn't seem to be some innate human tendency to distribute money at least in a fair and equitable sense now we could argue that we treat food differently than we treat money we absolutely do um, but, you know, it was really insightful that perhaps what we've accepted as the norm in large-scale Western societies isn't really what people are doing other areas, other places in the world. And so, <clears throat> to try to explain economic systems, we've got to look at how the economy is organized. And so the mode of production is the way of organizing production the way that you or organize production. Wolf defined it as a set of social relations through which labor is deployed to wrest energy from nature using tools, skills, organization, and knowledge. And we identify two primary uh, ways that the economy can be organized. One is through the capitalist mode of production. This is where money buys labor power uh, and money also buys goods. There's a social gap between the people, the bosses, and the workers that are involved in the production process. The other system of production that we see in non-industrial societies is a kin-based mode of production. This is where labor is given as a social obligation. So I'm helping you not because you're going to pay me to help you. I'm helping you because you're family, because I owe you something, because we have a long-term affiliative kind of friendship. Um, and in those kinds of cultures, we really can't distinguish um, between uh, the economic system and the general social system. And so the economy is integrated very intimately with every other aspect of the culture. Um, we do find that societies that have the same adaptive strategy typically have the same mode of production. Uh, and that when the mode of production is different, it may reflect an incredibly different environment, uh, incredibly different target resources, or uh, simply different cultural traditions. 
some of the ways that labor is divided up across populations are pretty consistent. For example, um, economic labor is divided according to gender and age, but the way that it's divided varies based on both adaptive strategies and through cultural specifics. So for example, among hunter-gatherers, we've got uh, male men hunt. We've got a sexual-based division of labor, men hunt. Um, women gather carbohydrate resources and take care of the children. This is generally thought to be because hunting's not conducive to child care, that you've got to be able to interrupt what you're doing if you've got a dependent offspring, particularly very young dependent offspring. Um, and that just isn't possible with hunting because you'll lose your prey. Um, among horticultural societies, most of the production is done by women. They do most of the gardening labor, uh, which is thusly producing most of the household food. Um, men then hunt and or cash crop or spend their time using psychoactive <coughs> pharmaceutical or uh, herbal based psychoactive substances and uh, and politicking. Among pastoralists, men own the animals and men tend to and move the large animals, but women will milk the animals and tend to smaller livestock like sheep or goats. And then among agriculturalists, we've had this notion that farm work is men's work and that women are just supposed to be in the house barefoot and pregnant, uh, taking care of kids, doing household production, etc., um, which is true to some extent. Um, particularly as we look at like the early modern system um, once the plow was innovated. But um, we can look at subsistence economies and see that this is not necessarily the norm. So among the Bacilio of Madagascar, they grow rice. They've got two t stages of teamwork in rice cultivation. They've got to work together, everybody in the village, the men, the women, the old, the young, <clears throat> when they're planting and then again when they're harvesting. And so it's this production role doesn't fall to one sex or the other. It doesn't fall to uh, one age group or another. And so, you know, as we look across adaptive strategies at gender roles, and we'll talk about this as, uh, you know, the, the next couple of weeks pass, we see differences um, due to gender stratification. And, and one of the aspects that mediates gender stratification is uh, is how much production women do. And um, when women do a lot of production, we find a lot more equality uh, across the genders. <clears throat> we also, in addition to modes of production, have means of production. This includes the land, labor, and possibly technology that's being used to produce. And so, all food production requires, or all, all production requires, the use of land, um, particularly as we're talking about subsistence economies. Foragers have kind of transient access to the land or ties to the land. That is, there are some, <clears throat> there may be some uh, kind of territorial, quote unquote, rights of access or ownership, but um, it's not permanent. There's not like legal ownership. There's uh, a less permanent tie to the land. So there may be historical land rights, but that doesn't mean you can't also use the land. In general, foragers will let other people uh, hunt and gather on their land as long as the same um, <clears throat> the same courtesy is extended uh, to them if they ask to use someone else's land. Food producers the rights to the means of production, including rights of access to land, including rights of access to water, including rights of access uh, to the labor for that land, um, that those are mediated through social um, social obligations and social ties. So, um, you know, we one of the biggest ways to convert um, acquaintances into friends is uh, to facilitate a marriage, uniting your groups. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we kind of structure this world into those that we know and those that we don't know. Um, and uh, uh, the one of the easiest ways to transfer those that we don't know into those that we know um, is through this facilitating marriage. And so, <clears throat> you know, in these small scale societies, of course, through kinship and marriage, we get that general social bond. Um, but, you know, there's also economic exchange that helps to um, make that marriage happen. So, you know, thinking about how labor, how uh, the rights of access to labor is mediated, we can think about um, 
we can think about pastoral populations. And so among pastoral populations, um, you know, girls live in their father's households until uh, there's been a marriage proposal. Uh, and when a gentleman is trying to marry a woman, he makes an offer of what we call bride wealth. That is a certain head of livestock uh, or a monetary payment to the bride's father um, in order to secure the rights to her labor, in order to secure um, the right to remove her from her father's household and bring her to the husband's <clears throat> household as a laborer. And so we see that um, that economic exchange is necessary then to secure this access and that marriage then ensures that her labor will be uh, kind of in this venue of uh, her husband's household. We also see uh, differential access in terms of specialization. So in non-industrial economies, this access to land and labor comes from social links. But we can also find that manufacture of certain items can be either linked to age or gender or also mediated through these social links. And so um, we find that tools are made differentially by the sexes or across um, sex and age classes. We find that uh, in larger populations like the Anamama of Venezuela, that we can even get village specialization. And so among the Anamama, certain villages specialize in certain activities and we build up a larger economic system. We start to link together villages villages into a regional system of production. And this held true for foraging populations in the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, we had these recent foragers in the Pacific Northwest. They were living in this temperate rainforest, relying on both marine and terrestrial resources, um, and phenomenal like overproduction. So they developed uh, chiefdoms um, really, or, or kind of a complex tribe, primitive chiefdom, um, even without direct food production. Um, and then they engaged in <clears throat> kind of regional sharing behaviors to help ensure access to everyone of, of uh, these things that were manufactured. So they would potlatch, they would gather together for a seasonal, um, chiefly feasts of redistribution, which helped to, uh, you know, Christian missionaries, when they first made it to the Pacific Northwest, viewed this as economically wasteful, um, kind of hearkening of uh, communism. Um, but <clears throat> it was a way to unite the whole region together into a, a regional economic base so that if there had been local food shortages because of local weather conditions, let's say periodic or site-specific flooding or something like that, um, that the people didn't die, the people didn't starve, that they still had access to resources through this larger regional system. <clears throat> In industrial economies, we find this sense of uh, a, a lack of pride, this sense of alienation. Um, when factory workers are producing goods for sale and for company profits, rather for their own use, they may hold less pride in what they make, they may become alienated from the items that they make. And so uh, this is certainly the case with modern uh, multinational um, industry. When we think about the iPhones of the world, um, Apple has a number of kind of Apple campuses, production campuses, manufacturing campuses in China, for example. Um, and so you go there to live, you go there to work, you go there to recreate, uh, you live in dormitories on the grounds, you spend your day laboring in the factory. Uh, any free time, you have structured recreation activities with other employees, and you're not really ever out from under the watchful eye of your supervisors. And um, Apple has had to install nets under all of the dormitory windows because people were throwing themselves out the windows to commit suicide. So, I mean, it's really, really extreme alienation. Uh, interestingly, there's a case in Malaysia. Malaysia has a lot of microprocessing plants where they're making the microprocessors that our phones or iPads or computers use. Um, and generally, it's young women that are doing the work. They work six days of anywhere from 10 to 16 hour shifts under the supervision of males. All of the factory managers are males. Um, <clears throat> they live on the premises in dormitories. They also have kind of company-led recreation. Um, and you know, these workers, both the, the Apple manufacturers in China and these microprocessor workers in Malaysia, 
they will never have the opportunity to buy an item that contains something that they've made because the cost, I mean, what they're paid is so little, the cost of these items is so exorbitant. So, you know, cell phone manufacturers, the, the actual laborers can't afford to buy those cell phones. These microprocessing uh, workers can't afford to buy computers. Um, so extreme alienation. Um, these women aren't able to organize, they're not able to unionize, they're not able to really protest the uh, working conditions, and so they have a form of unconscious protest, and that is spirit possession. Um, they claim to be possessed by were-tigers instead of werewolves. Malaysia has were-tigers, um, and what this does is shuts down the plant for two or three days. They've got to bring in a local medicine man. He's generally got to make a sacrifice, often of a chicken, uh, to appease the ancestral spirits and cleanse the facility before they're able to open up and start production again and so what these women are doing is buying themselves a couple of days off when things just get that overwhelming they would be more effective in resisting um this kind of system if they were able to unionize if they were able to demand uh fair kind of labor rights um but that just simply isn't the case for them so economists also analyze kind of what's motivating um, production, what's motivating, um, you know, what are we trying to maximize through production, uh, and ask questions like how are production, distribution, and consumption organized, or what motivates people in different cultures to produce, distribute, exchange, and consume. Anthropologists, of course, are viewing these from a cross-cultural perspective, and you know, economizing means that you're making a rational allocation of scarce means or resources to alternative ends. Classic economic theory assumes that our wants are infinite, the means are limited. Uh, in general, economists accept that modern Western production is based uh, for maximizing one thing and one thing only, and that is profit. Um, that companies are organized in such a way to maximize um, profits for the shareholders, for the people who have ownership in that country. That's not the case everywhere that we go, though. And so uh, when we look at subsistence economies, we find that sometimes people don't really care about profit. They'll do behaviors that are economically wasteful in order to gain in status, perhaps, or in order to uh, preserve social harmony. And so in subsistence economies, people are allocating their scarce resources to a variety of ends, including subsistence, that is, do they have enough to eat, uh, the replacement fund for their tools, etc., um, a social fund, there may be an education fund, do we send our kids to school, uh, uh, ceremonial funds for ritual purposes, um, and then first and foremost, a rent fund. And, and we like to think of this as being isolated perhaps to subsistence economies, but the fact of the matter is that you know, many Americans have to place rent first and foremost, and that we've got a number of households, particularly those that are female-headed, single-parent um, households, where sometimes you have to make the decision between having a place to live and having enough food to eat. Um, and so you're really kind of you know, gauging the, the prospect of being homeless against uh, keeping your children alive. Um, and the sad fact of the matter is that our economic system has such a skew uh, between the bulk of the people in our country and the few who monopolize the bulk of the wealth that you know we've got a number of Americans who are living paycheck to paycheck who are simply one paycheck away from being homeless so you know, these things that we think about that apply to oh poor or less developed nations you know in the third world or whatever uh, these are things that apply to a number of Americans right here at home um, you might yourself be intimately familiar with them so sometimes rent trumps all um, and uh, you know, sometimes you've got enough that uh, that you're able to allocate to multiple functions. But in general, peasants have to make those rent payments. They're even renting the land that they farm on. So uh, if they don't pay rent, they don't have the land to farm. The, this last aspect that we need to look at is how we distribute and then consume the goods that uh, that we've produced. And so Carl Pollyanna uh, proposed three principles of, of exchange. And those are the market principle, redistribution, and reciprocity. Society is usually dominated by one. The dominant principle of exchange is the one that allocates those means of production, that land, that labor, that technology, that capital. So we've got here presented two different 
uh, principles. Um, on the right, we've got a marketplace. And, and you could probably guess which of these principles applies to the marketplace. It is the market principle. Um, and so in this kind of context, we're, we're bartering for uh, prices. We're paying in currency. Um, so we work, we get money, we then take our money to the market and use it to buy whatever it is we need for our families. The other picture shows the Aceh during a communal food sharing event. So the Aceh are unique among hunter-gatherers in that they share everything. They don't just share meat. Most hunter-gatherer groups share meat and then each household keeps its, the carbohydrates that uh, that they have gathered and they, they cook a separate, each household cooks a separate meal. But the Aceh uh, cook communal meals and share everything very widely. Um, they are basing their exchange on the principle of reciprocity that uh, it all kinds of even out, it evens out in the end, that when you have, you share, when you don't have, you benefit from being shared with. So we'll start with the market principle. In capitalist economies, the market principle governs the distribution of the means of production. Items are bought and sold using money with the goal of maintaining profit. The value of goods is determined by supply and demand. So when we think about what it is that sets our price points, it's not really how much it costs to manufacture something. I mean, when we think about many of the items that we buy that we'll spend, I mean, does it really cost Apple $1,000 to make an iPhone X? No, it doesn't. It costs them a very small fraction of that, but because only a limited number are made, um, and because they saturate the market trying to convince people how much they need them before they release them, um, we see the price artificially driven up. So when supply is low and demand is high, things are priced high. When supply is high and demand is low, things are priced um, very, very low. So <clears throat> kind of the, the key to that uh, from a corporation standpoint, uh, the key to maximizing profit, of course, is to keep supply low and uh, make demand high. Bargaining is an integral part of market principle exchanges. Uh, we don't really relate much to bargaining in America because we don't think that we do it. We do essentially. We we price compare, we look at the circulars that come in the Tuesday mail or that come in the Sunday paper. Uh, we get online and we see who has the best, best price for uh, any given item before we go out to shop. We might choose to get our groceries um, at Albertsons instead of Smith's because they've got meat on sale this week. Or we might even collect coupons and, and kind of time our grocery shopping to double coupon days, etc. Um, this is essentially bargaining, but it's not as visible and in your face as what it is in other uh, cultures. When we were in China, we were cautioned before we ever went to the market for the first time to only offer about 10% of uh, what the price tag read. So if something said that it was 350 yuan, we were only supposed to offer three and a half yuan, um, which to me seemed like I don't know, exploitation, stealing, etc. Um, but interestingly, they get offended. The, the market uh, sellers get offended if you don't bargain with them. The other thing that happened was once you take or accept a price or once you offer a particular price, the example I can think of was that we had some people in our group who bought some Mao Zedong watches um, for 35 yuan, which came out to about five, seven dollars. Um, once they were willing to pay that price, uh, there was kind of this folklore that followed us everywhere we went, and you couldn't go anywhere in the country and buy a Mao Zedong watch for less than 35 yuan. So, um, you know, they, it's it was great fun to uh, to everybody involved, I suppose. Um, but this market or this uh, this bartering is uh, an integral part, and so prices are like freeform. Prices are less distinct. What you see on a price tag is not going to be what you in fact pay for that item. Um, and a lot of it's going to be based on how good you are at negotiating. You know, you've got to learn to um, kind of give your hands up and surrender and walk away like, oh, that's too pricey for me. Uh, and oftentimes they'll chase you down and come back and call you back and offer you an even lower price. So um, this bargaining is integral. Uh, next, we have redistribution. This is where goods or services move from a local level to a center, um, usually through a hierarchy of officials, of officials who may consume some of the goods. So it's basically taxation and redistribution. Uh, the flow of good is eventually going to reverse direction. So uh, we have something like this in the U.S. It's not our predominant means of exchange, but we pay taxes, right? Um, why do you pay taxes? Well, it might just be because you're scared of getting caught not paying taxes. Um, but essentially, we all benefit from the taxes that we pay. 
<clears throat> you might not think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, but we, we really do. So uh, property taxes, for example, those go to fund public education. And many of you went through public schools. Um, and many of you have children or will have children who go through public schools. We just voted uh, with this last election on uh, bonds for higher education. These are going to come right back and benefit you as students at our institutions of higher learning. Um, CNM will see a benefit from these bonds. UNM will, uh, Highlands, Eastern New Mexico, uh, you know, all of the colleges and, and universities in our state will benefit from the higher ed bonds. Um, we also we like to do things like have public libraries, go to clean parks that have equipment that's in working order. We like to drive on roads that don't have potholes. These are all the types of things that are facilitated through redistribution of money collected through taxation. Reciprocity is an exchange between social equals. This is normally mediated by kinship, marriage, or uh, another social tie, like just a really good friendship, long period of affiliation. This is what we find in, in egalitarian societies like hunter-gatherers, like small-scale horticulturalists. And the general idea is that I help you at time A, um, but at some point in time in the future, and it, bas it depends on which kind of uh, reciprocal relationship you're exchanging in, uh, that at some point in time in the future, you will uh, give me that same kind of benefit. You will help me uh, in a way that it all kinds of evens out in the end. With generalized reciprocity that we see among foragers, we're not really keeping track of time. When you have plenty, you share with everyone. When you have nothing, those who have plenty share with you. And in that foraging context, because you are closely related, because you are doing a resource that's very, uh, it's incredibly variable and that you're not going to be successful with every single day, that generalized reciprocity does lead to a system that really kind of evens out in the end. There's also balanced reciprocity. This is among acquaintances, not necessarily people who are close fr friends. This is where I work for an hour for you, but I expect sometime within the next week or so that you are going to also work an hour for me. Um, when you've got close bonds like kinship and friendship, you're not putting that same kind of statute of limitations on repayment. So um, we find, for example, among the Aquana who are horticulturalists in Brazil, that if you're kin, I might work five hours for you and you might only give me an hour in return. If you're not kin and you're more of acquaintances, if I work five hours for you, I'm darn well going to be sure that you work five hours for me before I ever help you again. So um, that strength of the relationship can facilitate um, whether it's generalized reciprocity or balanced reciprocity. We also have negative reciprocity. This is basically a payday loan that I'm going to lend you the money for your car title, but I'm going to charge you such an exorbitant interest rate that you're never going to actually be able to pay me back. I'm going to keep you owing me pretty much for the rest of our relationship. And this is the kind of reciprocity that we see among um, untrusting kinds of relationships. So maybe your rivals that have come together um, to quote unquote cooperate or, or write a treaty or something like that. You know, but at some uh, in some way, um, you don't trust the other one to ever be able to repay. In the United States, our predominant ma means of exchange is the market principle, but we talked about these examples. We've got redistribution, like with our system of taxation. We also have reciprocal exchanges. If you went out with your group of best friends and you forgot your wallet, what would probably happen? Well, someone would probably pick up your tab, right? Um, with the expectation that at some point in the future, and that point may be unspecified, uh, that you were going to then cover their tab or somehow or another pay them back. And, and this is the kind of exchange that we are certainly willing to accept with our friends, but we wouldn't accept with someone that we didn't know very well. With someone we didn't know very well, we'd want payback that was much more immediate. So in summary, know what distinguishes an adaptive strategy. I'd be able to identify the five that we talked about. We mentioned post-industrialism as a sixth. We're not going to talk about it in great detail. It's just that we're exchanging ideas. We're producing ideas or services, not really actually producing any goods. And when you think about the economic system that goes with post-industrialism, most of us don't ever handle money. We don't handle things of value. We get paid through direct deposit, and some number shows up 
then on our bank account. Uh, we pay our bills through uh, electronic funds transfers and some money is deducted from our bank account uh, and if we want to go shopping we might not even carry cash with us we shop with uh, with plastic um, it might be linked to our bank account and that money might come out right away or it might be linked to uh, a credit account where we don't have to pay it back till later so do we even really have a good concept of the money that we're talking about you know we've created this system that's incredibly incredibly vulnerable to hacking i mean identity theft is one of the um, one of the biggest problems facing many consumers today because we're putting all of our open information uh, out there for anyone to grab uh, understand what foraging horticulture and agriculture entail know the predominant social features that correlate with them uh, especially be able to distinguish between agriculture and horticulture know what pastoralism entails distinguish between nomadism and transhumance um, understand how contemporary foragers are brought into modern nation states uh, and kind of how we may if we're subsistence economies we may engage in multiple adaptive strategies or forms of labor you know we're, we're at a point now that oftentimes foragers instead of actually going out hunting now are cattle laborers for pastoral populations because that way they can actually earn some money um, though the money that they're paid is very very low um, distinguish between these modes and means of production understand how industrialism can lead to alienation and then lastly know these forms of distribution and exchange specifically the differences among the market principle redistribution and reciprocity